In today's episode, I have with me Mauricio, the founder of Ledin, which is described as the last crypto lender standing. It was a fascinating conversation as Ledin seems to be the only platform that has survived the FTX contagion and still offers USD loans on Bitcoin as collateral. The conversation was even more fascinating because Mauricio is from Venezuela and he shares some riveting experiences of hyperinflation in Venezuela and how he and his brother discovered Bitcoin mining due to the macro conditions in Venezuela. Today, I have with me Mauricio, the founder of Ledin, the last crypto lender standing. So I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, disclaimer, I have been and I am a custom, customer of Ledin, but this is not a sponsored podcast episode. I think some point of time I'll get to Mauricio to sponsor this uh, podcast, but <laughs> this 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 episode is not. So Mauricio, thank you for doing this and uh, thank you for coming on 21 Towers. It's my pleasure, Sandeep. Thank you so much for having me. So Mauricio, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in Bitcoin. Oh man, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> so I'll try to keep it brief. So I'm originally from Venezuela. Uh, that's where I was born and raised. And very early on in my life, I started experiencing hyperinflation like, uh, like many people did. Um, when Chavez came to the country. Chavez was a president, very, very politic, uh, polemic president that we had in Venezuela. Uh, and he came in in 99 and started uh, with, a, with a sort of very authoritarian agenda uh, and a very sort of hard left leaning, uh, basically started uh, doing really bad things against private businesses. And my family and many others kind of saw the writing on the wall and we went to the U.S., a lot of people in Venezuela at the time thought Chavez was going to be a one-term affair, a one-term president. Uh, and so they wanted to wait out the four years and come back. So we went to Florida. Uh, that's where I started learning English. Uh, and uh, by uh, we, we spent two years in Florida, but Venezuela was going down really fast. And my dad has had a lot of challenges managing his business from Venezuela. So, you know, in not so many words, we kind of we kind of started struggling to stay in Miami, earning earning Venezuelan income and living in Florida uh, was just not sustainable. So we had to go back to Venezuela. And when we did that, I had already kind of gotten the taste of North America and I wanted to come back to university. I wanted to finish my university in North America, but I couldn't my, my dad couldn't afford to send me back to the U.S. So I had some family in the in Canada. And so that's how I came up to Canada and started doing my university here. And Coincidentally, that's where I met Adam Reeds, who is co-founder and CEO of Ledin. Uh, and that's, you know, I'll get into that story in a second. But after graduation, my family never wanted to leave Venezuela, even though the stuff was, even though it was crippling and falling apart. And they kept trying to pull me back and I kept trying to pull them out. And by the time my youngest brother uh, came out of university, Venezuela was like falling apart and at that point, my parents were already supportive of getting all of our, the younger people, the younger generation to leave the country. But my brother didn't want to leave. And, and then, which year are you talking about? Like all of this, of course. Yeah. I, so I recently also things are really crazy out there. But yeah. So my brother graduated university 2014, uh, back in 2014. So this is almost 10 years ago now. And once he graduated and my family were very entrepreneurial. So my dad would always write us a little angel check for as we graduated university, my, my dad would grab, write us a little C check to, so we could start our small business and just give, give a swing at the bat and see how we did. And so I had my swing. My middle brother had my swing. It was now my youngest brother's turn. But the country was in shambles. Like there was nothing he could really do. Um, so we kept telling him to leave the country, but he didn't want to. And then you say the country was in shambles. What, like, is there anything specific or just generally? So I'll give you some examples. Um, hy hyperinflation. So right around 2014, um, right around 2014, I believe is when Chavez dies. Um, and so I'm just trying to think when exactly is it? Chavez dies in 20, 2014. Yeah. And the reason things were getting really bad it's because after Chavez dies, Venezuela has this massive election where everyone believes that we're going to get freedom back into the country, right? Because the, the, the Chavista ruling party has been in, in power now by for, for like eight years now. Um, and people think we're going to, no, actually not eight years. It's been, they've been in power for 15 years now. They get into power in 99. So we think we're going to get the country back. 
And when he dies, Venezuela, as the president dies, they have to call a new election. And when they called a new election, everybody thought the Democratic side was going to win now because Chavez had done so much damage to the country. Hyperinflation was soaring. People were leaving like left, right and center. And the election happens. And I remember distinctly flying down to vote in that election. And all my family, every friend that I knew, we, we, a lot of us were living abroad already, but we knew that this was our shot. So we invested on our plane tickets. We flew down. I, I still remember the plane ride down. Everybody was wearing their freedom hats. They're sort of, they're polit it was very political. Everybody was flying for a particular reason, to vote against Chavez. And, or to vote against Chavez's puppet, Maduro. Who, uh, um, and so the election is held. And the day, it, it just, it feels like freedom is in the air. Like you could, you could see it in the voting, you can see it in the voting stations. The country is like, it's, it's going to turn. And so after we vote, we all get excited. We all watch, we all go to see the results on the screen at night. And all of my friends, I have friends in the, in the sort of electoral, in the, involved, more involved in the political process. So they were calling me saying, hey, we're, we're up, we're up, we're winning. Like the polls are coming in strong. And that's, that goes from like 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m. By about 8 p.m., things start going dark. And we stop getting updates from our friends. Uh, and then the updates are getting darker, being like, hey, they're not closing the polling stations. They're doing all these types of funny games. They're not allowing, they're not allowing, like, they're not allowing our people, uh, our witnesses to, to look at the processes within the, the voting centers. And so things start kind of falling off the rails. And we start kind of getting hints that they're going to play games with the election and, and, and publish a result that's inaccurate. And in fact, that's what they did. I, I still to this day believe that that election was rigged. Uh, that's my own very personal feeling. Um, but the reality is that the Democratic side lost the election. But the Maduro, Chavez's puppet won the election. And at that point, it was very clear that there was very little democracy left in Venezuela. So this is the context in which my brother graduates. And as you maybe you may or may not know, but after this election, it's, it kicked off the largest migration crisis in the history of the, of the continental Americas. So more than 6 million people have left Venezuela since this election. And to give you some context, Venezuela is a country that at the time had 25-ish million people. So this is so as this is happening, my brother is graduating, and when everybody's leaving the country or looking to leave the country, selling their assets at pennies on the dollar to buy dollars so they can leave, this is what's, what triggers hyperinflation. This starts triggering this massive wave of hyperinflation. Everybody starts dumping their assets for bolivares and then pr proceeds to dump their bolivares for dollars to get the hell out of the country. As this is happening, my brother's graduating. <laughs> And he doesn't want to leave the country. When everyone else is leaving, he's like the salmon, you know, going against, <laughs> he wants to stay going against the current. And so my brothers and I and my father is like, man, don't, don't stay there. Just leave the country, leave the country. That's where you're going to find opportunity. So he, he keeps pitching us ideas to start businesses in Venezuela. And eventually he pitches us, he comes to sort of his last stand, right? He's like, if, if you don't support this, I'm going to like, you know, I'll walk out of this house. I'll, I'll do this on my own. You know, I don't need your support. He was kind of like digging his heels. And his last pitch is a project to buy these things called ASICs that they bought that mined this thing called Bitcoin. And I'm the finance guy out of my family and I'm living in Canada at this time. So my dad sends me this sort of white paper and my brother sort of pitch kind of with concern. And he's like, Maori, what do you think about this? And that is the first time I'm exposed to Bitcoin. And I see this and I read the white paper and I start trying to piece the puzzles together and the, how the miners play into this and what I do and you know how, how they fit into the whole ecosystem. And the way I got to the answer was, okay, these guys protect the network. They're like the bodyguards of the Bitcoin network. They use a lot of electricity and, and that's really, that's all they do. They, they, they are hard users of electricity to protect this network and then they produce these things called bitcoin that can be sold for dollars at this time in venezuela nothing could be sold for dollars <laughs> so 
the fact that these machines were going to produce an asset that could be sold, that were already producing a hard asset, but it could also be sold for the most in-demand asset in the world, which was the U.S. dollar. The most liquid and, asset. Yeah. And in Venezuela, electricity was highly subsidized. So to give you an idea, you know, people talk about 10 cents per kilowatt hour, 12 cents per kilowatt hour. In Venezuela, we used to pay le less than one cent per kilowatt hour at the time. So I said, okay, well, we have relatively cheap, if not free electricity. Um, the product can be sold overseas and that doesn't really require a lot of staff or employment. You, you can kind of set it up yourself. So I was like, find that out of all the things he has said, you know, I, this is probably the least concerning one. So my dad writes the check. My brother gets his first ASICs. And this is, for me, this was like summer 2015. So then <laughs> I fly back for Christmas 2015 and I go see my brother and see how he's doing. So I, I went to his facility and he doesn't have five machines. He has like 15 machines. And I'm like, whoa, how, how did you go from five to 15? And he goes, oh, I bought them. And so I'm like, hmm. So I go to my dad. I'm like, dad, did you give him more money? And he goes, no, he paid me back. And he reinvested his money into his machines. Those are his machines. And so then I'm like, I go back to my brother. I'm like, Mario, what are you really doing? <laughs> and he's like, I'm mining Bitcoin. And I'm like, show me. And so he goes, I'm going to show you. I'm going to sell this Bitcoin and I'm going to send it to your bank account. And keep in mind at the time, you couldn't hold dollars in Venezuela. It was very hard to buy, sell dollars. It was very hard to lose your bolivares, to protect yourself from these bolivares. The government makes it very, very hard to dump your local currency to protect yourself because that hurts their image. Yeah. So my brother says, my brother says, I'm going to send this little bit of Bitcoin to this exchange. It was called Sir Bitcoin at the time in Venezuela. Sends the money. The money hits my account in a matter of hours. And at, at, at the actual exchange rate that he told me it would be sold at, which was the right exchange rate. And at that point, I, my mind, I, everything became a blur. That was when I really can tell you hand over my heart, I went down the, in real time, I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole because he had traded Bitcoin into Bolivares at the real exchange rate, the fair exchange rate for someone on the ground in the context of the most hostile economic environment I have ever been a part of. And so that was to me the most incredible example of, of how money should be. And then I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about Bitcoin. I wanted to keep doing this. I kept, I, I wanted to start learning how to mine myself. We started teaching other people how to mine and we started expanding our minds. But eventually we knew that in a country like Venezuela, eventually something good was going to turn into something bad. And so we, we had to leave and try to do this somewhere else. So I came to Canada and I started building a mining facility because that's all I knew what to do. Uh, that's where I had my experience. And I convinced Adam, my, my best friend from university, to create this mine facility with me. We set up a mine in Quebec and then we start trying to grow our mine. But to grow our mine, we had to sell our Bitcoin, which we never wanted to do. <laughs> and then we start asking for loans against our Bitcoin and nobody would give us one. They thought we were crazy. Banks told us, and I quote, Bitcoin is not an asset. <laughs> and to us, that was ludicrous. And so after a few rejections, we kind of looked at each other and said, if we build this financing solution, we can help a lot of people around the world. And it's something we can do a lot better than mining because we're not making the hardware. We're not really you know, doing anything special. We're just connecting a computer that we buy from someone else into a facility that we you know, rent or buy from someone else. And so it's not really our, our but we both came from, uh, Adam came from uh, renewable energy financing and I knew how these products could help miners. So we kind of put our heads together and we created Canada's first Bitcoin back loan. And that was the genesis of Ledin. Um, sorry, I, 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 that was a really long rant, Sandeep, I'm sorry. <laughs> this was the best background story period on this podcast. Uh, I mean, I literally have goosebumps because 
here you have experienced bitcoin in in the worst environment for which bitcoin was designed to um and that's the reason there's so much passion in your experience i mean there's passion in people who uh, have experienced bitcoin in normal environment but you have truly seen it for what bitcoin is designed for and hopefully you know we avoid that kind of a future in in countries like uh, you know yours and mine uh, but no I, i want you to actually carry on in fact i don't want to talk about leden anymore i want to talk about your experiences <laughs> venezuela i mean this is just unbelievable you know when you i when you were talk when you're talking about hyperinflation in venezuela you have any examples or stories of how hyperinflation really truly affects people or you know oh. your, any experiences which you would like to share some crazy experience that you have on your mind which you can't forget yeah a few um so i'll start with a couple of things that really stuck with me so one was <laughs> people's uh idea of value gets very distorted so for example when i was growing up i remember i had friends it, when i was in, into my teens some people started buying cars okay and i i did and i didn't get a car till i was much later later on but i had friends that would buy cars their parents would buy cars for them you know when they were 16 17 and they would brag that so so for example they would say oh i bought this toyota pickup truck for 10000 bolivares just to give you an example or 10 million bolivares okay and then a year later i sold that truck for 12 million bolivares so i made bolivares on my depreciating truck and i was sitting there saying We, and you're looking at your economics books right like and you're saying okay assets depreciate assets are supposed to be worth less over time and so when you get a car you drive it out of the lot and then three months later it's worth more than what you paid for it you start thinking you're a genius but you're not a genius you you're your bolivares you might have more bolivares but if you try to dollarize the value of that car it's less dollars but nobody was doing that math because they you know they live in in that currency world so people were saying oh it's it's in my best interest to buy this car because it appreciates in value now you can see how that is is a big problem right because what's happening is because of the currency the local currency is depreciating so fast what ends up happening is that assets get monetized so for example if you have you know if your rupees are worth 10% less every day or if your bolivares are being worth 10% less every day and every day you're going to say okay what is not devaluing at 10% day to day and so the first thing you'll do is oh dollars right and so okay i'm going to go buy some dollars but your government very quickly is going to say hey sandeep you can only buy $100 a month <laughs> yeah right and then you're going to say damn i've capped my $100 where do i put the rest of my money and so you're going to start looking at the list of assets and they're going to say well cars are very liquid properties are not as liquid as cars so people started buying cars to park their money like literally and that bit of the prices for cars we saw some of this in north america by the way we saw used cars in february of last year i bought a truck and the agency was calling me saying hey you could turn around and sell your used truck for more than what you bought it for <laughs> and i'm i'm starting to lose my mind here in canada as i'm hearing these things because i'm getting deja vu <laughs> sort of all over the place um so you know it's shocking that you mention it i bought a car in singapore and when i sold it after 2 years i almost got the exact same value just because of inflation there you go and so this is this is something that was unheard of in modern economies yes. unheard of you would have never thought but now in now you're starting to see some of these things mind you you know central banking and currencies are all relative right so that's the problem and that's what gets me, a lot of people uh that's what gives them a pass because the US might be crazy but if everyone else were even crazier <laughs> that which is kind of what's happened they they call the US dollar the least dirty shirt in the pile right uh so and then the other thing that i was going to say in terms of hyperinflation how it impacts you um as your money is worthless so you know how we have most countries have uh limits for the amount of money you can withdraw from an atm right or limits for the amount of money you can transfer to someone else right in venezuela when hyperinflation was so bad 
the limit on your ATM at times was $5. And to withdraw those $5, you would get like a wad of cash this big because the, the highest denomination bill was sometimes a quarter. <laughs> and, uh, and so what, what, what ended up happening is no ATMs have ever cash because they're all drained out. The bills are too small of a denomination. So anybody that takes out you know, $100 drains the whole ATM. So you have to wait for the next day so that it gets replenished so people can take out another 100 bucks. So the limits to pay become very small. So my credit card limit could be $100. So you can't pay anything with a credit card effectively. Uh, and so that becomes very hard. It becomes impossible for businesses to transact uh, you know, in, so, in, some, in some very practical ways. How are things right now? Are they as bad as they were five, 10 years back? Is it improving? So um, it depends what you ask, I guess is the right question um, or the right answer. Uh, some people will tell you that inflation is not in the, in the millions of percent. So that has come down. But if you, if you think about that, it's because most people have already left. <laughs> Right, like the big rush of inflation comes when everybody's looking for the door. But then you're, then you're left with the people that kind of accepted that they had to stay. Uh, and and then also the, the base is really high, right, already. It's correct. like what we're seeing in the U.S. as well. With such high inflation over the last two years, you're now talking about inflation already in a very higher, higher base level of prices, right? We're, we're talking like Venezuela is, is celebrating hundred percent year over year inflation, like celebrating as if it's a great thing, right? Um, that's like our that's normal. That's like great, and so people will look at that and say, "Oh, things are so much better." <laughs> you know, um, not not the case. Um, I would think I would say that there's the other thing that happens is there's been huge brain drain. So whenever this happened, the best doctors left, the best professors left, the best teachers left, the best engineers left, uh, the best everything leaves. And that's, that's the other thing that people don't often appreciate is that migration happens from the top down. Like by the time you get to the, so it, and here's the thing, when migration starts, none of the neighbors complain. Why? Because you're getting the best of the best. Does that make sense? Like when the, when the Venezuelan migration crisis started, the United States started getting the richest and the wealthiest of Venezuelans because they were the first ones to leave. They, they say immigration, the first migrants leave on a plane and with a, and with a visa. The second migrants leave on a boat. The third migrants leave on foot. And sadly, nobody complains when the first two groups are leaving. Yep. When the third group starts leaving, crisis. Close the doors. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening. Mauricio, what a story. I literally have goosebumps listening to you uh, right now because, you know, these are things which uh, when we read the media on hyperinflation and stuff, these are probabilities that can happen. They, they seem theoretical when media writes about it. You, Venezuela has experienced it, experiencing it, and these are real stories, is, uh, warnings uh, basically for the for Western countries and for developed economies. But uh, thanks for sharing. This is just, <laughs> this is, I can keep talking about this really, uh, you know, to it's Dude, just. Uh, it's my pleasure. I think people need to hear this uh, because I, that's why I almost, I, I get my blood boils when I hear someone say something like, what's, why would anyone ever need Bitcoin? And <laughs> you know, it, it's yeah. uh, it's a it's a very privileged point of view, you know, in my in my humble opinion. My God, I'm gonna have so many shots from this podcast to post online because <laughs> it, it's just it's unbelievable. But anyways, we'll we'll go to Ledin. So tell us a little bit about Ledin's lending and borrowing platform and how it works, how it differs um, sure. from other platforms in the market. Sure. So I'll I'll give you the. The, I'll, you know, I'll try to be as concise as possible. So as I, as I mentioned, Lenin, Lenin comes from wanting to solve our own problem. We didn't want to sell our own Bitcoin. We needed a loan. Nobody would give us one. And we saw a big opportunity in solving that problem because we figured other people could have this problem too. And, uh, and if you think about how rich people, and this is something else that 
that I learned from hyperinflation is the way wealthy people perpetuate their wealth is by buying assets and they keep their assets and they don't sell those assets because it's always better. They're always better off borrowing against those assets than selling those assets. And the way wealthy people have perpetuated this wealth in the United States in particular is by shorting a depreciating currency by parallel in parallel going long a hard asset. So for example, it, in many parts of the world, yeah, this, is, this is called a mortgage where you are effectively buying a house with a massive loan from the bank that is often priced at below the rate of inflation. So you're getting a 2% loan to, to basically buy a house. But what you're really doing is you're long a house and you are short dollars, aggressively short dollars at a rate below inflation. So what that does is that the value of the house goes up and up and up and up and up. The value of your mortgage goes up by 2%, which is a lot less. And then in five years time, your mortgage is 1 million, your house is worth three, and then you can do the refinancing. And lo and behold, you perpetuate this wealth building cycle over and over again. Um, so to me, this, this works in North America. But nobody ever wanted to lend me a how, uh, dollars to buy a house in Venezuela. Nobody ever wanted to lend my friends to buy houses in Colombia. Most people do not have access to this type of financing. So what we wanted to do was create a mortgage for your Bitcoin that would allow you to access liquidity and hopefully one day bring the price of those borrows to a rate that was at or below inflation. And today, I can, I'm can i very proud to tell you that our loans are 9.9% uh, annualized plus a 2% admin, but mortgages are at seven. <laughs> like when, when we started out, we were at 18 and they were at two. And now we're at basically, we're there. And we're about to launch a product that, that lends dollars at 3.9% annually, which is, we're there. We're, we're going to make borrowing against your Bitcoin cheaper than borrowing against real estate and more convenient and more practical and more accessible to everybody. That's a big part of the mandate. So, but what is different about Lenin? Well, when we were building Lenin, we, we thought it was a bit crazy that more people were leaning into the transparency of Bitcoin as, as a differentiator. So for example, we were the first lender to do proof of reserves, proof of reserves attestations. We believed that in order for us to enhance on the people, loans exist, you know, loans exist before Lenin. Lenin is not that we didn't create loans, but what we did create is a more transparent way to offer these services by letting you, the client, verify every six months that we're accounting for your assets correctly. And this is exposed to you. You can check that we report the right balance to the accountant. That's part of the process. And that's something that makes us really proud. And it's funny because we invested in that two years ago when, when nobody thought it was sexy or cool. And for us, we, we focus very much on simplicity, transparency. Uh, we support two assets and we, we try to do it as transparently as we can. And for proof of reserves, is it just the asset side? Because I've seen criticism on some of the other companies that you cannot do proof of reserves on your liabilities. Um, what's your take you, on that? You absolutely can. So our, our process includes the liabilities. So what the, the client liabilities, which is very important. Now, what a proof of reserves, how our process works, and I'll explain how our process works because the, the thing is a lot people can sort of label certain things proof of reserves and they're, they're different processes, which yeah. adds to the confusion, you know, in fairness. So in our case, what we do is we bring a public accountant, certified public accountant. They get, um, at the same point in time, they'll get an anonymized list of our client balances. So for example, we'll say Mauricio holds three Bitcoin in a savings account. He has five Bitcoin as collateral. He has a loan for this much. Uh, and he has, you know, that, that's really it. Or, or he has this many USDC, right? And so what happens is every six months, uh, our accountants get an anonymized list of all the assets that our clients have. And me as a client, I'm able to go to the accountant's website and verify 
that my balances were reported accurately to the accountant. Yes. The way you can game this is by under-reporting what you owe, and then that means what you have is going to look a lot better, right? So what we do is we let our clients check that we reported their balances correctly, and then then the accountants at the same time, at the same point in time, get a dump of all of our statements. So the assets that we hold at custody, trading partners, banks, uh, lending relationships, and what they do is they met, make sure that all the assets that we have match and surpass the what we owe our clients. And so, and that's that. It takes care of both sides, the assets and the and, and the client side. It's not a silver bullet, may I add, because a lot of stuff can happen beyond accounting, but it's a big, big uh, reason or driver or incentive to keep things precise. Yeah, at least it's a big step towards transparency. If it's not the perfect step, you know, it's a spectrum, right? And uh, I know you wanted to say this, so you know, I've plugged it in the screen. Not all lending platforms are created equal. So explain that. Definitely. So, uh, you know, it, it's perhaps not news to most people watching this. There's been a lot of scandals in this industry. Um, there's been a lot of players that represented themselves as responsible actors and as prudent risk managers, and they were not. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that has caused a lot of pain to a lot of people. Why I say not all lending platforms are different is because clearly we're here today. We're able to be here today because we've managed our risk uh, and we've been able to navigate this whole episode without impacting our operations or any of our client assets. So what I, what I want to say is that Although these platforms may provide services that look similar on the surface, the back end could not be more different. And how we make these services a reality could not be more different. So a few things that we do that others don't or that we do very differently from others is A, our simplicity. We only support Bitcoin and USDC. That allows us to focus and that allows us to contain the things we need to pay attention or the distractions that we have around our team. The other thing is that these assets are deeply, deeply liquid. If you look at most activity around the lending industry, 80 to 90% of all volume happens on Bitcoin and stable coins and Ether. And if you add it, those are the three assets. The other assets have temporary liquidity, temporary, uh, it comes in waves. How so, come you've not added Ether? Isn't there too much pressure from, I don't know, investors, clients? No, it, it, reality is we, we've, what we've always wanted to do is build the best suite of services for one asset before adding additional assets. So if you, what, what we're wanting to do is really build out the full suite of options and solutions for Bitcoin. So we want to give you more LTVs, lower interest rates, other types of products where you can get different types of yield uh, with different types of risk. And, and once we feel that the suite is built on one asset, um, we are looking to add additional assets. So it's something that we're exploring uh, for ETH. Uh, and it, it's something that may be coming actually later this year. But, but again, it's, it's, we're, we're focused on start finishing the full build out of the Bitcoin suite before we add others. And that's, that's how you scale impacts the business also. So for, I'll, I'll give you an example. At Lennon, we made the decision to start doing proof of reserves two years ago. Why? Because proof of reserves is a very complex process internally. And if you try to do proof of reserves on a company that has 45 products and 100 assets, yeah. it becomes impossible. Whereas if you put it as the first thing and you add the other products, understanding they have to comply to this, it, it acts, it, it just grows differently. And so we've always wanted to build the base, the foundation on Bitcoin and build it to the point where we feel is, is perfect. And when we get there, we'll start exploring additional assets that can already be thrown into the platform and open up a whole suite of services that has already been built on that, on that infrastructure. So, so that's the idea. Um, and, uh, and the reason also was because it's the, the Bitcoin community has been amazing for us. I, I'm a, I, I feel like I owe a lot to the Bitcoin community and, and, um, you know, we, we, we've had a blast just, you know, focusing on Bitcoin. Uh, you know, we've seen the tremendous opportunity. 
we do see the opportunity and we we want to do this uh in a responsible way i guess is the right uh way of saying yeah. it yeah definitely at least right now you guys are the poster boys of uh, bitcoin once you add eat i don't know whether you know the bitcoin community will still be big fans but it's okay um so what are the before we go into the risk part of it because i do want to address that especially for the audience that we cater to tell us a little bit about the type of products that you offer right now definitely so today we offer lending products uh lending solutions uh savings products saving solutions uh and trade but i'll go through the 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 savings actually works uh, relatively simple, so I can explain that first. Uh, savings are, uh, we offer savings accounts in both USDC and Bitcoin. And what that those products are is they are accounts where you can deposit USDC to earn up to 8.5% APY, and you can deposit Bitcoin to earn uh, two and a quarter, I think is the rate right now. And how we, how we do these products, how we make these products uh, exist, what allows these products to exist is on the dollar side, the primary use of those funds is to our own loans, right? We lend dollars to people that don't want to sell the Bitcoin. So a large way of how we fund that is through the uh, the, the USDC savings account. Um, on that side, we've processed over $500 million worth of loans for the last 40 years. We haven't lost a penny. Uh, that algorithm, that engine is, has never had any failures, uh, which is something we're very proud of. Uh, on the Bitcoin side, how we generate that yield is we aggregate the Bitcoin that the clients deposit on Lenin. And then we have a team that essentially uh, underwrites loans to institutions that need these Bitcoins for, uh, you know, whatever activities they may need. Today, uh, we focus primarily on lending to market makers that are Delta neutral and that have more than half of the revenues from traditional finance. And uh, what that does is that it ensures that uh, the groups that we're lending to are not overexposed to movements in the crypto markets or sort of anything that could happen to crypto, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a natural hedge uh, on that end. Do you recommend anybody depositing Bitcoin? I struggle to recommend anybody depositing Bitcoin to earn a small yield for an asset which on an average grows about 100% uh, per year. It depends on the person, right? Like, it, it, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend anybody putting their whole stack on, on a service to earn uh, at, to, to, at anywhere, to even whether it's Latin or, or anyone else. Like, you know, it's just pro uh, adequate risk management is, is, you know, dictates you should not have all of your eggs in any one basket. Um, I think it's a personal decision. I think if you, uh, if you feel like that interest rate compensates you for the risk that you uh as you understand it, are getting into. And this is something we try to be very, very clear about. We want you to know the risks because we want you to make that decision on your own. You know, the, the, the biggest thing and one of the big things that led to all of this mess that we saw last year was that these risks were not being properly addressed. And last year, when we were the guy telling you that this was potentially a risky product, um, and that we weren't going to raise our rates because we didn't know how those guys were paying those rates because they were probably doing something insane. Um, but people kept telling us that we were that we were the boring Canadians. That was really the the you know oh guys why you know why don't you pay as much as Celsius or BlockFi or and and we kept saying to them well we don't see those rates in the market like if if and where I do see them they're not the same risk profile that we're taking. It's completely different. And so what I would tell these clients back at the time was, listen, if you feel that you really understand how you're getting that interest rate, and if you feel like the rate you're getting compensates you for that risk, then I, I have to tell you to go take, you know, take your assets there. If that's how you feel, I can't tell you Sandeep how many clients have had call me back saying you were right. You know, uh, I don't take any pleasure in that because they don't have those assets anymore. Um, so anyway. And I think that's, that's exactly the reason that not all lending platforms, not all interest rates, it's not all the same. You can't compare a number of an interest rate with on one platform to the other because the risks are different. It's hard lessons that have been learned over the last year. Uh, is the, is the Bitcoin deposit account on which you can earn a yield a popular product? Very. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I have to say people, people, 
there has been a reaction to everything that's happened. You know, we've had, we've seen people be cautious. Some people have taken, have made withdrawals. A lot of those people have actually started coming back slowly. Um, but understandably, the other issue was, maybe I'll explain this because it was infuriating at the time. Back in 2021, we had these websites that were um, ranking yield options. And they would say, oh, you can make this much here, this much there, this much there. And they would just, they would rank them as if they were apples and apples, yes. right? It's like, oh, you can get this much here. Oh, but Lenin is only paying you this. So they're, they're like at the seventh or eighth place. So, but they're, they're showing them as if they're the same risk, as if all you're choosing between this is logos. And I thought that was poisonous, like absolutely poisonous, because you could tell how some companies that were playing games to optimize their assets on platform, they were willing to pay mark rates that weren't even there so that people would take their assets to their platforms. And this created a very um, dangerous behavior. Uh, we, we had some platforms that were even saying that their deposits were FDIC guaranteed. Um, and, and so it was, it was a lot of misinformation, uh, frankly, that was going around. And it was very frustrating at the time but we, where we never veered off, right? Like we, you know, we could have started taking on more risk and paying those rates to compete with these people, but that was not, we didn't see a long-term future in that. Uh, and so we rather kept getting called bored, boring uh, until, you know, we didn't want this to happen, but a lot of our theses have been validated uh, uh, rather than disproved, right? Well, more than validated, uh, again, disclaimer, uh, I was using BlockFi and then I moved my entire business to you guys. And yes, I think two, uh, in fact, twice I removed all my funds from Ledin during the crisis. Um, each time they were executed at, you know, executed perfectly. In fact, just right now with the banking crisis, again, once I was telling you right at the beginning of the show that I've re removed it, of course, we are in touch. I just, you know, when there's a crisis, I remove it. I do intend to put it back. And each time the execution, in, in, especially the last time was, I think, even a bigger crisis. Right now, there's a banking crisis. There's no crypto crisis. Last time, there was a crypto crisis. And, you know, I mean, yeah, you guys, absolutely, uh, the execution was flawless. Um, so, yeah, congrats on that. Uh, just to carry on with the other products um, that you were explaining. So, you, the savings yes. product. Sorry, so that was savings. So on the borrowing side, which is our bread and butter, this is what people know us for. We're Ledin. We're a lending company. So our, our flagship product is our Bitcoin back loan. And what that product is, is you place your Bitcoin as collateral so you can get the dollars you need without having to sell your Bitcoin. So um, basically how the service works is if you have a Bitcoin, right now I'll call it a $22,000, $22, you can come to Ledin, put that Bitcoin as collateral, and you can get a $11,000 loan. And you can repay that loan at any time, no penalties. Um, you only accrue interest for the days you have the loan open. And there are no monthly interest payments required. Um, this is important because we work with people all over the world in Venezuela, uh, you know, all, all, all over the world. And we, our loans start at $500 uh, because we know that people, the portfolio sizes vary. And the people that need this the most are people that probably have not as much Bitcoin. So because it helps them grow the, the, their asset base. So obviously, if we're, if we're charging 10% on a $500 loan, it would make very little sense for you to have to send us $5 a month on a wire or you know, it would cost you more to send it than what we would get. And so what we, we, we structured the product in a way that it was just easy to use. And the product accrues interest over time. You can repay it at any time. You'll pay the interest then, but you don't have to pay it on a monthly basis. Um, that product is very popular for things like tax season. You know, nobody wants to sell their Bitcoin to pay for their taxes. Um, we, we see a lot of people using that to diversify their Bitcoin portfolio into something else. So real estate is a popular one. Uh, paying for school, paying for expenses, starting a new business, believe it or not, is one of our most common uh, reasons for loans. And um, then the most popular loan we have is our B2X loan which is a loan that you can use to basically use the Bitcoin you already have to buy more Bitcoin. So in the first case, you take your Bitcoin, $22,000, and you take $11,000 off the platform, you get a wire that you can use for your expenses. On this one, 
on the B2X product, you can take the same Bitcoin worth $22,000 and you can let it will lend you another $22,000 to buy another Bitcoin. So at the end of the, of the product, you'll have two Bitcoins plus a loan for $22,000. Um, again, these products, we do not um, issue these loans based on people's income. Uh, they're backed by the Bitcoin collateral only. And this is why it's important because the risk on these products is that if the amount we lent you gets close to the market value of the Bitcoin, we will have to sell that Bitcoin to, to close the loan. And I like telling this to people because the last thing we want is to sell that Bitcoin. Um, yeah. We want you especially to walk out with more Bitcoin. Selling, yeah. Especially for selling at the bottom of the market. C correct. And so yeah. this, yeah, uh, go ahead, Sadeep. No, I was just saying that, yeah, so it's important that even if anybody wants to use this product, it should be a small percentage of their Bitcoin portfolio that is used to leverage more additional Bitcoin or get a loan. Maybe 5-10% uh, in a bull market, you could go higher when the prices are already bearish. So if, if you're getting into a loan today, uh, you know, where the prices are maybe, you know, towards it's kind of bearish, then you could have a higher percentage of your Bitcoin that you could use as a collateral. Well, 100%. Thank you for that. And we we are always working on services that help protect our clients. So a good example is auto top up. So for example, we Bitcoin can move 24 seven, it can happen when you're flying, it can happen when you're asleep. And many times our clients have the additional Bitcoin, but the price movement can catch them circumstantially unavailable. And so we wanted to create a product that would ameliorate that pain. So right now, because we have a savings account and you have a loan account, you can pre-authorize Ledin and turn on what's called auto top-up. And our auto top-up feature, you pre-authorize Ledin to move Bitcoin from your savings accounts to your loan in real time. You could be asleep, you could be flying, we'll do the motion to cover your loan. Uh, you do have to activate this and you have to make sure you have enough balances on your savings accounts. But if you plan accordingly, it's a very powerful tool. No clients that have activated auto top up to date have been liquidated. So it's something that is makes makes my heart full. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and what about any other products you want to talk about, Mauricio? So yeah, we have our trade feature. This is something that a lot of our clients asked us for because we have USDC and Bitcoin on the platform. And sometimes the market was moving and they wanted to go from one to the other or vice versa. Uh, and that was something we launched last year um, to let people you know, decide how they want to be positioned within Ledin. They, because in the past, you would have to withdraw your Bitcoin, take it to an exchange, sell it, bring back the USCC. So we wanted to kind of short circuit that and let people do that on the platform. Um, we also have two very cool products coming up. Um, actually, three. Uh, we have a, a very a low interest loan product that's going to come out at 3.9% APY. That's going to be a beta pilot. Um, if anyone's interested, they can reach out to me directly. Uh, we have um, dual, dual cryptocurrency notes, uh, which are uh, a very exciting product that lets you earn yield uh, on USDC or Bitcoin. And it has a different um, mechanism to generate that yield. The, the Bitcoin and the dollars are not being lent out, uh, but they still allow you to earn that uh, yield. Uh, the the, the trade-off is that you're getting potentially conversion risk. So for example, you will subscribe US dollars to earn a higher interest rate than we have in our open account. And you will have to select a Bitcoin price and a time in the future. So for example, if you start with, let's just say you want, you're a happy buyer of Bitcoin at $10,000. You can uh, subscribe into a USDC note for $10,000. Or, or sorry, you can subscribe, say $100,000 into the note and you say, my, I'm a happy buyer of Bitcoin at 10K at the end of June. And this is just an example. It's too far down. But we will say, okay, Sandeep, we can offer you an interest rate of 6%. And if Bitcoin is below 10,000 at the end of June, you'll get the $100,000 divided by the Bitcoin price. If Bitcoin is above that price, you just get paid the 6%. So it, you take on conversion risk. No, I, I think you are taking an options product and making it simple to understand for regular users. Bingo. You got it. Yeah, yeah. No, totally makes sense because I think there is an opportunity for yield over there, but most yes. people don't understand options unless and until you're a professional, you know, trade five guy. 
So, and, okay, that's the second product. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and so as you've, as you've probably seen in the products that we offer, they're dead simple. Like the whole point is that they are dead simple. We, uh, I remember when I started trading or when I was getting into Bitcoin early on, you log into these platforms and they look like a, like a power station. You know, you had, so if you're not a professional trader, you're kind of out there. And options is an incredible uh, tool. Uh, but to your point, it's, it's almost like on purpose made complex. And what we try to do is abstract a lot of that complexity and distill the value into the product. And we manage a lot of that risk also at the end, uh, at the back end. So the clients don't have to. And then the third product is our P2P transfers, which is the ability to send money to any other person within Ledin instantly and for free without having to input their sort of, you know, big public key. Um, all you have to do is say, you know, you can select a username. So I can be at Mauricio. You can be at Sandeep. And I'll just log into my Ledin account and I'll say at Sandeep, send them 100 USDC. And it'll be sent immediately and for free. Uh, and so that is another thing that I'm very excited about. Um, but I'll pause because, you know, those the P2P, DCNs and, um, and the low LTV or low interest rate loans. And for the, I would, it's a fantastic products, uh, you know, and just can you talk about the risk, um, you know, when a low interest product is there, is the client taking on more risk on their collateral because it's re so, so, yeah, so it's, it's the same level of risk as our standard Bitcoin back loans because our loans today are rehypothecated, right? So that's, we're very transparent about that. Rehypothecation is, an, is, a, is a word that has gotten thrown around and given a negative connotation uh, and fairly, I mean, not, not fairly, it's just the, the word is misunderstood. Uh, so for example, when we talk about rehypothecation, the, the most cases, what we'll end up doing is we take the Bitcoin that's being placed as collateral to us to take out a bigger Bitcoin back loan with a bigger institution. So if you're taking a $10,000 Bitcoin back loan from us, we'll grab that Bitcoin and that Bitcoin collateral along with a bunch of other $10,000 loans and we'll take out a $1 million loan with an institution. So we use your Bitcoin as collateral to pledge as collateral to that institution. It's, that is rehypothecation, but that is what allows us to get the funding to fund these loans when our USDC balances are not enough to fund uh, the Bitcoin back loans. And then in the, if we have enough dollars on the Bitcoin saving, or sorry, the USDC savings account to fund the loans in the right market conditions, we can also lend part of the Bitcoin collateral to offset our costs and offer you a lower interest rate, which is effectively how this 20 or the, the lower LTV loan works and why you were, were able to offer you a lower rate. So we, we like being very transparent about how these products work on the back end and, and the risks associated with them as well. And so just to, I think the best way for you to talk about the risk would be how, why are you guys the last crypto lender standing? What did you guys do differently over the last six months where each and every competitor is wiped out? They were all bigger than you, backed by amazing founders, Genesis, BlockFi, what happened? That is a very how good question. <laughs> And, and so I can, I'm happy to kind of, it's a bit of a long answer because it, it's not a one, it, it's, it wasn't like a, you know, silver bullet. It was a, a combination of, of things we did right and others didn't, didn't. So one, I'll kind of take you through the sequence of events. So please, it all, it all started with Terra and Luna, right? Like the, the whole thing started when Terra and Luna started collapsing. Terra and Luna was a big decentralized finance protocol that wiped $60 billion uh, of, of, of paper profits. We do not expose any client assets to DeFi to generate yield. And so we were never exposed to Terra or Luna. When Terra and Luna happens, because it was transparent, you could see which companies were yanking money out of the protocol to, to fulfill their deposits. And of course you start seeing some lenders uh, Celsius, I guess, in particular, was yanking money out from Terra very, very fast, and people could see this. So when people saw that, they, they started pulling money out of Celsius, right? And so when that starts happening, groups like Celsius and others start calling back other loans 
to other groups, not just Terra. They had money on Terra, but they probably had money elsewhere. So they start calling all those loans again. A lot of these groups worked with an entity called Three Arrows Capital. And Three Arrows Capital was also heavily involved in Luna and had money from groups like Celsius and others. So they were getting called back from all angles. And eventually, Three Arrows collapses and takes down Voyager, uh, takes down basically Celsius, and takes down a, a, a bunch of others. We never worked with Three Arrows Capital because they never passed their underwriting requirements. They came to our desk a few times, but they never met the requirements. They didn't provide very simple things that we asked them for, in particular financial statements. Uh, and, and they told us at the time that we were crazy because we were the only groups not lending to them. Uh, and we said we'd prefer to be the crazy ones than, than the others. So when Three Arrows collapsed, we were not associated with Three Arrows. We had no exposure to Three Arrows either. So we, were, we didn't have an impact. Then, um, so it was Terra Luna, then Three Arrows. So then once Three Arrows happened, we, we did have a relationship with Genesis uh, at, at the beginning of Ledin. Uh, but as we grew and as we built our own desk, we saw that it didn't make any strategic sense for us to keep working with Genesis because we were lending them our coins. People were starting coming to us directly for those coins. And a lot of times we ended up competing with our own assets because Genesis was bidding with a group that was coming to us directly and they were bidding us lower. So it just made very little sense for us to work with Genesis. And after the, they had an impact from Three Arrows, after those news, we decided strategically that it made no sense to continue that. So we closed our last loan with Genesis in October of last year. One of the things we don't do with Ledin is we don't lend to any one counterparty more than we can absorb uh, for that particular reason, because we need to be able to make sure that if anything goes wrong, we'll be able to absorb without having impact to our client assets. Uh, and then, and that's how we navigated uh, FTX at Alameda. And of course, when Genesis falls, we no longer had a, a relationship with Genesis, so we weren't impacted by Genesis. And then since then, we've been just monitoring the market. So for example, uh, over the weekend, when all this stuff was happening with Signature and all these other banks, we were basically like, we had no assets on Silvergate. We had all of our assets on Signature were well within the coverage ratio over the weekend. So we're, you know, our team is essentially uh, monitoring uh, any, any sort of uh, potential window for risk, right? And we're always mitigating that as fast and as effectively as we can. So uh, those are just a few examples that I think kind of encompass uh, how we do this. And the other thing is we have done proof of reserves from very early on. And you saw once this whole happened, everybody started rushing to try to create these, you know, proof of reserves exercises. They were sometimes incomplete. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have the liabilities. They wouldn't have all of the assets. We've just been churning them because we've been doing them for a while. Our next one is actually at the end of March. Uh, and it's going to be available to our clients in mid-April. And uh, do you have any comments on the USDC? Because besides Bitcoin, the only stable coin that you support is USDC. And it was crazy that it got depegged at almost 10%, right? It fell 10% below its value over the weekend. Any comments on that? Did it affect your business? So we, we had some people that were asking questions that were nervous because, of course, you know, even though we're not the, the operators of the stable coin, you know, we support it. So people had questions. Uh, we, we frankly didn't have any additional information other than what was being shared publicly uh, uh, from Circle. What I think of what I think of this is is it's almost um, um, it, it's it's funny in certain ways. One because the the problem is that people were concerned about Circle because they're transparent, right? Like because you knew exactly what the reserves are, because you knew exactly how much they have in each bank, and that allows you to be worried. How many times do you think this have happened to Tether? Like we just don't know. Well, we won't know how many letters they've received or how many, you know, defaulted loans they may have, or we won't know. And so it's easy to, you know, to bang. And so it's one of those things where it was almost like transparency played against them. Um, and and I, I have a hard time, uh, you know, uh, saying, oh, this certainly didn't happen to Tether. Tether is safer. I don't, I don't buy that. Um, I, I still think USDC is the best operator out there. Um, and funny enough, the issues that they were facing had nothing to do with their operations. 
it was it was a banking issue. So I don't know that we could pin this on 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 this on the circle team. I think this is sort of circumstantial and and unfortunate as as it could be. It it it, it highlighted some risks, right? And I think this actually is going to make USDC a better player, uh, having having survived this. Uh, yeah, and they they came back to their peg in a very short period of time. So absolutely and. So what do you think of the banking crisis? Uh, do you have any comments or what's happening? Uh, listen, I think whenever you have these types of events like we had last year, it's it's kind of expected that you're going to see some type of overreaction from regulators. Um, I, I think I, I would think that right now, you know, you're seeing a little bit of that. You know, you're seeing almost like you know, the, the pendulum swung too far on this side. Now it's kind of swinging too far to the other side. Um, I think it's unfortunate for, for the, for the, the U S banks that did support uh, innovation because they're kind of being chastised right now. And it's almost like right now, it doesn't even matter if you're a small bank that supported innovation or not, you're just a small bank and you're going to get absolutely crushed uh, because because the U.S. broke your asset liability mismatch by raising interest rates, like yeah. it's it's completely unfair. If you ask me, uh, what's happening? It's not their fault in most cases. <laughs> um, they, there was very little they could do. Um, so I think the the unfortunate reality of this is that a banks are still going to ban crypto companies because there's too many compliant crypto companies with a lot of great businesses out there to not have banks. And the other reality is that those banks may not be in the U.S. anymore, in Canada anymore, and that a lot of those innovation, those big round checks and employments and, and investment that you're going to see will maybe happen outside the U.S. Uh, for the little bit. So it, they're just they're just kind of shipping their innovation offshore. Yeah, truly volatile times, and um, you know, U.S. seem to be ahead in the crypto space over the last couple of years with the mining shift and. It seemed like regulation was also following the right path with certain states, Texas, Wyoming. And this is this definitely feels like a couple of steps back. Um, Maurice, a fascinating conversation. How can people find you? How can people find Ledin? You can find Ledin at Hoddle with Ledin is our uh, a Twitter handle. At Ledin.io is our, is our website. I'm on Twitter at Cryptonomista. Uh, it's Cryptonomist with an A at the end. And, um, and I write our newsletter every week. So if you want to check us out, uh, you can subscribe at blog.ledin.io. Uh, and I, you'll hear from me every, every, uh, every week. I send out a, a, a calendar on Mondays for what we have ahead for the week of Bitcoin. And then I have some market commentary that goes out uh, midweek. Super, Mauricio. Thank you so much for doing this. Fascinating background story. I think one of the background stories I will never forget. Thank you for coming on 21 Towers. Thank you for the time, Sandeep. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for your support over the years.